Now that is an effective operation. At this point, they decide to put on the German uniforms, which I love. Partly because the Germans look so stupid in their, in their undies. It's a great movie, but it's fiction. You make a Second World War movie, the Germans got to be in tanks. That's the rule. I'm Dan Snow. I love history and I love movies. So I'm going to review some of the all-time World War II classics. Guns of Navarone. So this is the scene in which our daring bunch of commandos are disguised as Greek fishermen and they're on the way to the island. Oh yes, they get, they get found by a German patrol vessel. Not much the Kriegsmarine still floating at this point of the war, 1943, only a few little patrol vessels in the Mediterranean. Most of it had been sunk by this stage. Uh, disguise was not unusual for commandos. The, the early SAS raids in North Africa, famously, they would, they would wear German uniforms and disguises. Lower yourselves! They are coming aboard! So the job of a commando was to blend in, use unorthodox tactics, use disguise, false flags, pretend they can't speak German in this example. The Dodecanese campaign in Greece is a really interesting one. It's forgotten about. I've met quite a few veterans who took part in the special forces operation in the Greek islands. And Churchill in particular was fascinated by the Aegean Sea, the Greek islands, partly because uh, of his uh, World War I proclivities, his, his idea about um, reinforcing Russia through, through Gallipoli, through the, the Bosporus. The Americans were having none of it, in fact. The Americans refused to support the Dodecanese campaign. And this is a very fictionalised skirmish. I mean, this, this didn't happen. I think it would have been pretty tough for an outnumbered small group of commandos with light arm to take on a, uh, a German naval vessel, even a small one like this. Use the grenades there, classic commando weapon, big bang for your buck. Down the ventilation into the heart of the German vessel. And you look at these special effects, this, this won the Oscar award for special effects. Now that is an effective operation. A skirmish like that would not have ended that quickly or in that manner. And this is a reflection, I think, of how in the 60s and 70s, Second World War movies were becoming slightly more glamorized, slightly more fantastical. These were like good looking groups of swashbuckling commandos. Uh, performing superhuman tasks and changing the outcome of the war. And that's why you, you get a different flavour of war movie in this period. I also like the way these commandos are shown as, I don't know, they're pretty handsome, Gregory Peck's a looking guy, but they're not, if it was a modern movie, they would all just be super buff, super ripped, and it's more realistic. I mean, they actually look like some of the people you see in photographs. The Commandant will telephone you shortly to congratulate you, Missile. Thank you. Here we see an SS Hauptsturmfuhrer, an officer, absolutely out of central casting. He's got, like, he's got the lightning bolts, he's got the skull, the death head on his cap, he's got blonde hair and blue eyes. He's such a perfect Nazi that he actually plays a Nazi in The Great Escape as well. A liar! But you're a liar! Uh, and he's interrogating the commandos. What is true here, technically that's against the rules of war, it's against Geneva Convention, you're not allowed to physically, um, you're not allowed to beat um, prisoners, but the Germans hated commandos. And it, in October 1942, the Germans had, Hitler had signed the so-called commando order. Any commandos were to be killed, they were not to be treated like enemy combatants. 
These men, they, they stole my boat. They, they, they forced me to join them. Your Excellency. Bring us in forward. Your Excellency, I, I am their prisoner. Holding out against interrogation for the first minutes and hours after they were captured was so important. In the days that followed, it doesn't really matter because any useful tactical intelligence is out of date by that point. But if the Germans want to know what they're doing there, have they planted explosives, they need to find out within seconds and minutes of the capture of the commandos. Call the sentry in. I think this is reasonably unrealistic that you would manage to disarm and escape from a group of, of trained German soldiers. But it's not impossible, I guess. Not very hygienic, I must say. Shocking taste in undies, too. Oh, well. At this point, they decide to put on the German uniforms, which I love. Partly because the Germans look so stupid in their, in their undies and their vests. It's not unheard of in the Second World War that Allied units would wear German uniforms as disguises to confuse the enemy. There were special forces raids, for example, in Tobruk in North Africa and Libya, where uh, the SAS other units wore German uniforms to infiltrate into German positions. Good luck. They're going to leave their comrade behind, and that wasn't unusual. It was thought that if someone was badly wounded, their best chance of survival might be to leave them with the enemy and hope that they received humane treatment. He's a wounded officer. I expect him to get proper medical attention. We don't make war on wounded men. We're not all like Hauptmann Zessler. So that we're not all like Hauptmann Zessler. So there's a nuance there. You see that... Already, people are trying to make a distinction between the SS, these fanatical Nazis, and the rest of the German army. Now, historians have challenged that distinction in recent years. But the, as, we, as people tried to rehabilitate Germany and Germans following the Second World War, it became easy to say, actually, there were good German soldiers and then there were particularly evil Nazis. And you see that in this movie. You don't hear very much about the Dodecanese campaign, and that's because it was a disaster for the Allies. It was Hitler's last victory of the Second World War in the second half of... 1943. The Americans thought it was such a bad idea they refused to get involved. So it was all down to Winston Churchill. And I do think Churchill wanted to establish Britain back in Greece, uh, back in that part of the world. And I think Churchill was desperate to tr make sure he could try and contest Eastern Europe with the Soviets. He did not like Stalin. He was worried about Stalin's communist Soviet takeover of Eastern Europe. Even by 1943 he was worried about this. And I think he wanted to try and feed British troops and influence up into the Balkans, up into Eastern Europe, to make sure it just wasn't a clear field for the Soviets. So that's what's going on here. That's the Dodecanese campaign. It's a disaster for the Brits and the Allies. Uh, thousands of British troops are captured. Uh, and British ships are sunk by German aircraft in particular. And it was Hitler's last great victory. Das Boot. This is an important reminder that U-boats spent well, most of their time on the surface. They had the capability to go underwater, of course, but they travelled from A to B. Where possible, they would do this. They'd get their they'd surface and get their binoculars out and try and look for Allied shipping. Destroyers? No. No screen. They have no protection. Nothing. Allied ships were travelling in convoys. They would group together for protection so that naval vessels could herd them, a bit like sheepdogs with a big herd of sheep. That damn moon. Doesn't like the full moon, of course he doesn't. Massively increases visibility at sea at night, so it's much easier to see the periscope or the conning tower of a submarine uh, or a U-boat on the horizon. It's worth a try, Captain. Come left to 180. You get a sense here that these U-boat crews are predators. They are like wolves stalking and attacking uh, a herd of elk. They're always weighing up the risk-reward factor. Should they go in or should they stay back? And on this occasion, they decide to go for it. What 
absolute trash off the lubricating oil! Low angle bearing 050. Locked on? Range 2200 meters. Check! Those two that are overlapping! They're getting ready to fire torpedoes in the torpedo tubes which face forward, mounting the bows. And there you can see the Allied ship. It's incredibly... Veterans have always said this is a very, very realistic movie. Of course there's things that they pick up on that say weren't quite accurate. But enormous... They went to enormous lengths to try and make sure this was as authentic as can possibly be. Two, three, fire! Two, three, fire! Two, four! There you go, an Allied naval vessel has arrived, a cruiser, usually quite a lightly armed ship with depth charges and a gun mounted on the bow. My grandfather did this exact job in the Canadian Navy in the Second World War. He looked out for U-boats in the North Atlantic year after year. And when they saw a cruiser, the best thing to do was die. Quick, quick, quick! Keep it moving! Keep it moving! Move, 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 move! Keep it moving! You get them all rushing forward to try and dive the ship, which I think is accurate. The, the, the weight of the bodies on board did have a big impact on the trim of these submarines. So get forward, get some weight forward, it'll help you dive quicker. We hit the first. Out of the way! We hit her! We yeah. hit her! <laughs> quiet! And the key thing is to remain as quiet as possible. The sonar equipment on a, a Allied naval vessel, a cruiser like this, it could pick up the scrape of a, a pan moving across a, a grill. So everyone had to stay as quiet as possible. Number three. Sometimes those German U-boats would submerge, maintain total silence, the fleet would pass above them. They could hear it passing above them uh, and then they would uh, re-emerge from the water. They'd surface to look at the damage that had been caused. In this case, they've managed to destroy that Allied cargo ship. The back's already broken. He says the back's broken. That's an expression uh, you use in naval warfare, meaning the ship is irreparable. It's, it's, it's lethally wounded. If those sailors were lucky enough to survive the explosions on the ships, the fires, the flooding, sometimes their only option would be to jump in the Atlantic and they wouldn't last very long in there. They went to extraordinary lengths to create a very realistic submarine. The company that built the original U-96 built the set. Uh, every dial, every sprocket apparently was accurate. The captain of U-96, the wartime U-boat, was an advisor on the movie and so was another member of the ship's company. The actors were all trained as submariners, so they got into the role, they, they understood how to move and operate within a submarine environment. Better blow. Blow all tanks. This scene comes just after an attack by aircraft. Aircraft were fantastic hunter killers of German submarines, and as air power was extended across the Atlantic as the war went on, submarines suffered more and more. Every submarine movie contains a scene where the submarine dives much, much deeper than its safe operating envelope, and this is no exception. They go down to something like 900 feet here, which is too deep. Uh, and the idea is they hit this ledge, they hit this underwater ledge, and they, they survive on this shelf. A German submarine, I think, would have been crushed at about 400 feet. The hulls simply weren't built to withstand the kind of pressures that acted upon uh, the hull at this depth. They know in this scene that if they go any deeper, they'll be crushed in a split second. Once that hull is compromised, water will come in at thousands of miles an hour. Two hundred and seventy meters. First watch, stand by. 
260 meters. And I'm sure that whole crew would have watched that depth gauge, knowing their lives depended on what that little needle was doing. Two hundred forty meters. <laughs> there was an obviously intense camaraderie uh, on these vessels, but it wasn't quite as informal as, as, as is shown sometimes in this movie. And there was still a distinction between officers and men. Officers were treated with some respect. In this movie, sometimes that isn't the case. The movie has been praised for showing these Germans not as monsters but as human beings, as young men who were given a job to do and no choice about doing it either. Let's be quite clear, all dramatic adaptations are, are made up. They're fiction, they're not history. But this is a very, very authentic, very realistic depiction of, of a U-boat's crew, of a U-boat campaign in the Second World War. It's widely regarded as the best submarine film ever made. And I think as a movie, it gave us a sense of the other side in the Second World War. The decades following the war, the movies tend to f focus on the Allied effort. And here we are getting the other side. We're looking at the Germans. We're seeing them as human beings, not as cardboard cutout evil Nazi officers. And I think it's a very, very powerful film, a very human film. It shows us how lethal German submarines were how vulnerable they were as well. Bridge over the River Kwai. Aufstab, Rindenas! Collect your tools! Okay, back in your place. Alec Guinness, who plays Colonel Nicholson in this movie, knew what he was talking about in many ways. He'd served in the Second World War, he'd seen action, he commanded a, a landing craft during the invasion of Sicily in 1943, he was in the Navy. Belligerents may employ as workmen prisoners of war who are physically fit other than officers... Same major book. And by all means, you read English, I take it. Do you read Japanese? I'm sorry, no, but if it's a matter of precise translation, I'm sure that can be arranged. You see, the code specifically states that the... The, the Japanese commander is obviously unimpressed with the Geneva Conventions. He calls it the Coward's Code. What code? The Coward's Code! And it is true that the treatment of Allied POWs particularly on the building of this so-called railway of death, uh, was appalling. The Geneva, Geneva Conventions did exclude officers from manual labour, it's true. Uh, Alec Guinness is making a good point here, but the Japanese had no interest in that. Since you refuse to abide by the laws of the civilised world, we must consider ourselves absolved from our duty to obey you. My officers will not do manual labour. He's talking to Colonel Nicholson, who's based on a real-life Colonel Toosey. And in fact, both characters are quite a long way off the, the true, the men that they, they sort of represent. Major Saito, by Japanese standards, wasn't a very bad officer. He was happy to negotiate with the men in return for labour. And after the war, Colonel Toosey actually stood witness for him at his war crimes trial, and they became friends after the war. What I like about this film is the depiction of rank. Even in captivity, officers still mattered. Officers commanded. There'd be a senior officer for each prison of war camp. And men were expected to do what they were told, not just by their captors, but by their own officers. And then their own officers would act as the kind of go-betweens between their captors and the men and attempt to sort of negotiate, perhaps ameliorate some of the, the harder aspects of captivity. <laughs> So the Japanese had an idea of using vast numbers of prisoners of war, 60,000 British and Imperial prisoners of war, hundreds of thousands of labourers from Asia, and they would build camps all along the route of this railway, some only hundreds of metres apart, and then build the entire railway simultaneously. It was a gigantic undertaking from the end of uh, 1942 to the end of 1943, a huge, huge undertaking. And it was incredibly difficult. It was known as Death Railway. Disease malnutrition, mistreatment by the Japanese captors, building at construction accidents. It was terribly dangerous. Dozens and dozens of men were killed every single day on this death railway, and it's become infamous. And this movie is the most famous depiction of it in drama. Hello, Clifton. About time you paid us a visit. In this clip, you see the building process. 
Nearly everything about this film is wrong. There were actually two bridges over the river. It wasn't the River Kwai. Uh, there was a concrete bridge and then there was a more temporary wooden bridge. But this shows the building of the wooden bridge. Interestingly, there's only one Japanese guard picture on that mound. And that's because escape was pretty much impossible. Uh, those jungles were so thick, your chances of surviving in them, as particularly as a European, were very, very slim indeed. I've talked to a couple of veterans who remember people escaping from captivity in Malaya. And in both cases, they remember those escapees coming back to the prisoner of war camp because what they experienced in the jungle was worse than what they were experiencing in the prisoner of war camp. What we're doing could be construed as, forgive me, sir, collaboration with the enemy, perhaps even as treasonable activity. Are you all right, Clifton? We are prisoners of war. We haven't the right to refuse work. I understand that, sir, but must we work so well? Must we build them a better bridge than they could have built for themselves? This is the part of the movie that's widely panned by historians and veterans. It was described as codswallop uh, by a man who served on the Burma Railway. Uh, the actual, the man this is based on, Colonel Tuzi, he was not as is portrayed by Alec Guinness at all, who, who seems to kind of get Stockholm Syndrome, to suddenly, to suddenly take the Japanese side here. It's very odd. The bridge over the River Kwai, I think, gets the context right, it gets the vibe right, but it gets nearly everything else completely wrong. Gets the name of the river wrong, gets the number of bridges across the river wrong. And in particular, I think, gets the character of Colonel Nicholson wrong. The man he's based on, Colonel Tuzi, had to navigate a very, very difficult set of circumstances. He had to ensure that his men did the bare minimum to keep the Japanese off their back. And that means literally off their back, keeping them from being beaten and starved to death. But he also had to make sure he wasn't doing too much to advance the Japanese war effort. And he did everything he could to slow down the build and make sure the build was low quality. So it's a great movie, but it's fiction. The Knight of the Generals. Major Grau to see General Dunst. Major Grau, just a minute, sir. MBCP, Colonel Sandow. The Knight of the Generals. It's not one of the most well-known Second World War films, but I like it. And in this scene, we get a, a portrayal of the destruction of, of Warsaw. Now, Warsaw was terribly, well, it was destroyed by the Germans during the Second World War. And this actually shows the action taking place in 1942, which is inaccurate. The real destruction of Warsaw came in in 1944 with the Warsaw Uprising. What? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You may pass, Major. Stop! Obviously, because they're depicting Germans, they've got to depict armour. But, you know, if you make a Second World War movie, the Germans have got to be in tanks. That's the rule. Wait for me here. This is Wehrmacht's radio unit assigned to the Reichsgeneral government of Poland. The Polish were desperate that they would not be liberated by the Soviets under Stalin. They wanted to liberate themselves. And so in the Warsaw Uprising, which I think this is loosely based on, you get the Poles rising up, try and seize control of their country, seize control of their destiny, before they're liberated by the Soviets. The population is extremely cooperative and friendly. Sector 4 reports Phase 1 operatives, Sector 2 plane throwers went into action. Phase 1 to continue until further orders. Yes, sir. The order came down from German high command that Warsaw had to be levelled to the ground in order to set a terrifying example to the rest of Europe. The Germans wanted to make sure that anybody else, any other resistance organisations elsewhere in occupied Europe, did not try the same as the Poles and, and rise up and try and liberate themselves. A few more minutes. And that's why you see uh, the appalling destruction and violence rain down on Warsaw and its people in this period. Flamethrowers, look at those flamethrowers, brutal weapons. That's an accurate depiction of, of flamethrowers. Phenomenal weapons to be used against enemy positions, bunkers, underground positions, in this case, buildings. Flames could carry through corridors, and they could be carried by infantry, hugely effective. For phase two. Phase two, sir. Stand by for phase two. Yes, sir. Notify all units. Phase one completed. Stand by for phase two. Yes, sir. So here you see General Tanz, he's called the hero of Leningrad. He didn't exist. He's based loosely on a man called uh, Colonel um, Joachim Piper, who was the youngest SS officer to be made colonel. He was a protege of Himmler. 
He was an incredibly unpleasant human being. He was involved in some of the most notorious massacres of the Second World War. He was involved in the Holocaust. He massacred people across Europe, France and elsewhere. He boasted that Genghis Khan would have willingly hired him and his associates, that terror was their best weapon. A wave of terror went before them. Uh, Piper was an appalling, appalling criminal. The Warsaw Uprising saw horrific fighting. 16,000 Polish resistance fighters died, thousands more wounded, and then something like 200,000 civilians killed, many in mass executions. It was savagery. <laughs> See Major Grau driving through lots of uh, lots of German units, lots of set dressing, lots of mechanized infantry, just sitting around doing nothing, bit of armor. He's off to arrest General Tans in this scene. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Good luck to him. We repeat the message from the office of the military governor of France. Adolf Hitler is dead. Members of his staff are under arrest. The new government. As he gets out of the car, as he arrives at headquarters, he hears the shocking news that Hitler is dead and senior Nazis in the government are under arrest. The coup is underway, the famous July 1944 coup, the attempted coup by German military officers to kill Hitler and get rid of key senior Nazis. It failed, but for a few hours, on the afternoon of the 20th of July 1944, people thought that Hitler was dead and certain officers moved to arrest key Nazis. Sergeant, get me Berlin on the radio and put it through the general's office. General Tanz. Yes. In Warsaw two years ago, I wanted to question you about the murder of uh, Maria Kupiecka, remember? Who cut the telephone wires? But Hitler was not dead. Hitler had survived a bomb blast in his Wolfslayer headquarters. A table leg had shielded Hitler from the blast, which killed two people uh, in very close proximity to him. He had perforated eardrum, his uniform was torn. He was lucky to survive, but he wasn't dead. Corporal Hartmann, your driver. This is Berlin. We are transmitting the following most important message from the Führer's headquarters at Rustenburg. Today, at 12.40 hours, an attempt to assassinate the Führer was made by a group of vicious traitors. The Führer is alive. But word was trickling through from East Prussia, from the Wolfslayer, Hitler's headquarters, that Hitler was in fact alive. So all these officers were having to make split-second decisions, and any officers that made the wrong choice were brutally, brutally executed. Where were you last night, General? Between 11 and 2 a.m. He shoots the man trying to arrest him for treason. And I think this is interesting because he knows at this point that there's going to be a gigantic witch hunt within the German officer corps. And you do see a bit within the German armed force at this point, you do see a bit of score settling as people try and adjust this new reality. And he realizes if ever there's a good time to shoot someone, it's in the aftermath of this coup, because he can claim, well, this officer came to try and convince me to break my oath to Hitler. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Take him away. It's one of the most dramatic moments of the Second World War. It's one of the great what ifs of history. At 12.42 in the afternoon of the 20th of July, 1944, a bomb was detonated in Hitler's headquarters. He was leaning over a map table. Two people near him were killed. His eardrum was perforated. His uniform was ripped apart in the blast. Many people were injured in the room. But his life was saved, tragically, by a very solid table leg against which the bomb had been placed. The plan was, once Hitler had been killed, was to round up senior committed Nazis, have a military control of the government, to try and come to some negotiated peace with the Allies, perhaps with the Western Allies in particular, uh, and fight on with the Soviets. It was a desperate, desperate plan, which probably would never have worked. But the message went out to certain key conspirators that Hitler had been killed, and they started acting accordingly. In Berlin, officers tried to arrest members of the SS, they tried to arrest senior Nazis. In Paris, the commander of German troops in France went around arresting SS officers. But as word trickled through that Hitler was alive, the situation changed rapidly. And for example, that commander in Paris was forced to shoot himself. And in the hours and days that followed, you get loyal, committed Nazis, like General Tanz, portrayed in this movie, they go around settling scores. They arrest anyone who they suspect even had a whiff of involvement with the conspiracy. Anyone who they think harbors disloyal thoughts towards Hitler. Anyone like that is gonna get brutally, brutally tortured. They're gonna get interrogated and they're gonna be executed. 
Hope you've enjoyed these movie reviews. I've made quite a few of these, so if you want to watch some more, click on any of the videos around me now.